powertrain warranty. Visit carsplusguam.com for details. McDonald's of Guam, I'm loving it, and King's Restaurant, serving your local breakfast, lunch, and dinner favorites for over 45 years. Head on primetime. The United Nations is backing Protehila Texan and Blue Ocean Law's claims of human and indigenous rights violations. Plus, Adriano Cotero shares how over 900 FSM citizens are stranded on Guam and abroad. And Nestor Lacanto has the latest on how dialing locally will soon require the area code. Hoffman, good evening. I'm Adriana Cotero. Protehila Texan has spent years fighting for the protection and preservation of our island's sacred lands. And for the first time in history, the UN is backing it up. Through three of its special rapporteurs, the UN is joining Protehila Texan in an allegation letter to the U.S. government on serious human rights violations, including the impact of the military buildup suffered by the indigenous people of Guam. Protehila Texan's Maria Hernandez. We've exhausted so many avenues. Um, locally, we've met with military officials, we've met with um, local officials, we've met with the governor. Um, we have, um, you know, 25,000 signatures on our, on our petition. We, um, we were able to lobby our lawmakers through the years to pass two resolutions to pause construction on the firing range complex. In total, the local group has moved forward with more than 450 actions since its inception five years ago. Hernandez says they're definitely excited and that they're feeling energized to move on to the next step and move forward with continued actions. But in August, or back in August 2020, Julian Uggen with Blue Ocean Law and the Unrepresented Nations and People's Organization, on behalf of Protehila Texan, filed a submission to the UN Special Rapporteur in Indigenous Peoples. Last night, Governor Lou Leon Guerrero issued a new executive order extending the public health emergency that was due to expire on April 1st for another 30 days to now May 1st. The order maintains indoor dining to 50% occupancy and table seating at up to eight persons. Maintaining six feet social distancing, outdoor dining will continue at no more than 15 people per table. Also, social gatherings and congregations are still allowed at no more than 50 persons. Over 900 FSM citizens scattered all over the country are stranded, and some feel abandoned by their nation as they have spent the past year without an income and away from their home. These citizens are crying for help to be repatriated. We are labeled stranded, but we feel abandoned by our nation. And this is our cry for help. Yulene Perman lives in Ponape, but for the past year, she has unwillingly been forced to call a Guam hotel room home. She left the FSM during the travel ban in May of last year to accompany her 24-year-old pregnant daughter through her delivery process. Although at that time, she was expecting to return to Ponape by July. The ban continues to be extended through the public health emergency declaration. And the president extends it. He's been extending it like every two months. And we understand, you know, as citizens, because we care, I care about my children back home, my family and the, everyone, you know, we don't want them, we don't want this um, pandemic to get there. So we were, you know, we've been very patient. Um, we've been very understanding, um, but I believe that time has come, you know, to bring us home. Perman says today was supposed to be the last day for the current travel restriction. But FSM President David Pinello has announced plans to extend it for another two months. She says President Pinello has instructed the governors for the four states to prepare for repatriation, but they are all just waiting for him to say when. A repatriation flight was planned for December of last year, but was unfortunately canceled. Now over 900 FSM citizens are living on a prayer. Hawaii resident Shanti Asher is not stranded, but her parents who had to travel for an emergency are. They came because we lost a baby um, in our family to stillbirth. And um, three days before they are to depart, they're packed and ready. They were called by United that they will not be leaving because of an extension. While holding back tears, Asher pleads for assistance for her fellow FSM brothers and sisters. She says the citizens stranded in Hawaii were given two checks through the year of $1,000 for the primary applicant and $500 for an additional one. But this does not include any dependents. 
There are so many people that I do not even know how they are surviving day by day, not knowing for a year now. And then, and how many kids have been left alone because their parents came for an emergency. And, you know, if, if you are going to keep extending, then put these people in your consideration and empathize because they don't have money. And if they're going to sacrifice, then at least give them some CARES funding money to survive while you are trying to figure it out. If FSM borders are closed off for the foreseeable future, then their next appeal is for financial assistance for these people making the ultimate sacrifice to ensure their home is protected. If you cannot allow the border to open for them, then at least give them something to live on while you're trying to figure things out. According to Paulina Perman, who is also in Hawaii, the vaccine is readily available for FSM residents 18 years old and above, but the president will not consider repatriation until herd immunity is reached, despite that many of the stranded citizens are already fully vaccinated. If they're sacrificing and willing to do anything in their power to just meet the requirements that the president is asking of all of our citizens, why are they being... Um, uh, uh, held hostage. Held hostage and feeling neglected by their nation. The president has never, not to my language, he has never acknowledged his, his stranded people. You know, at least a press release or an, any kind of form of acknowledgement that says, you know, I, I know you're out there. Mm -hmm. I, I care about you. And um, I'm trying my best to bring you home. We just want to go home. You will soon have to include Guam 671 area code when calling a local number. The FCC will be establishing a new emergency hotline number that uses a Guam dialing prefix. And so local carriers are mandated to make the switch to a 10 number dialing system. Nestor Lacanto has more. GTA Chief Operating Officer Andrew Gale says the FCC will be adopting 988 as the new number for the National Suicide Prevention and Mental Health Crisis Lifeline. Because of the, you know, the high number of deaths associated with suicide in the U.S., they want, the FCC wanted to have a, a, an easy-to-remember three-digit number that will become as ubiquitous as, as 911. But in order for that to work, jurisdictions that have 988 as a prefix have to switch to 10-digit dialing. In short, because Guam does use the prefix, you will have to add the 671 area code before the standard seven-digit number. The FCC will not be activating the new suicide prevention hotline number until July of next year, but Gail says carriers have to start enforcing the 10-digit dialing well ahead of that so customers can start making the transition. What'll happen is come October 24th, if you start dialing that number on a, on a GTA line, we'll probably give you a recording. We're still working out the treatment. The call won't go through. We'll give you a recording. They'll say maybe something like, uh, your call can't be completed his dial. Please check the number and try again. He's not aware of any shortcuts for updating contact lists. You can manually add the 671 to the numbers on your cell phone or save and replace a number when a call or message is received. For Guam's News Network, I'm Nestor Lacanto. April 1st may mark another monthly rental due date, but it's no laughing matter for thousands of local families who are struggling to keep up because of the pandemic. Here's an update on the Guam Rental Assistance Program. Department of Administration Deputy Director Bernie Guinness says as of Tuesday, 2,600 applications have been filed, 860 have been reviewed, 440 were deemed eligible, 275 were not eligible, and 145 applications were incomplete. She says they plan to send out the first checks to landlords by next week. We've started giving out those notifications since last week, since we first started the eligibility, um, the pre-eligibility actually. Um, so again, it's all contingent upon the applicants, the tenants submitting their documents back to us. Audrey Toposnia of the Guam Housing Corporation says applicants who were rejected still have 20 days to appeal. The program does recognize that um, from the IRS, it was recently released about those receiving PUA 
that if you filed your taxes, you can submit, I believe, some kind of um, uh, amendment or modification to their taxes, which will reduce their, um, uh, I think, their income up to 10200 A second review will be conducted of those who were deemed ineligible based on income criteria. Toposnia says 40% of rejections were because applicants did not meet COVID impact criteria. Another 40% were not at risk for homelessness or unstable housing. And 20% were rejected because of income. Meanwhile, another round is planned. The second cycle more than likely will be happening on the first week of May. The money can be used for back rent and utilities. In total, about $33.6 million is available for the first round and $29 million for the second. The program will continue until all of the funding is exhausted. For Guam's News Network, I'm Nestor Lacanto. Thank you, Nestor. And stick around for more news here on Primetime. You're watching KUAI. Swim on in for Ruby Tuesday Seafood Sensations and enjoy your favorites from the sea in perfect time for Lent. Get hooked on lobster mac and cheese, the salmon loco moco, or the deep sea pasta. There's a bounty waiting for you on the RT Seafood Sensations menu at Ruby Tuesday Guam. While we've all been through a lot over the years, typhoons, earthquakes, and now COVID-19, we've been able to get through these together. For more than 80 years, Pablo's Insurance has been protecting your homes, your business and the health of your family. We are here today and we'll be here tomorrow. There are better days ahead. Tomorrow's a new day filled with hope and choices. The possibilities of what we can achieve together are limitless. Let's continue to work together to ensure a brighter tomorrow for all of us. Whether you use your truck for work or play, you can count on Ram Trucks. Built to deliver today and built to deliver for many years to come. Here at Cars Plus, it is Ram Truck Month, where you can get the best deal on a new Ram 1500 starting at a new low price of $31,995. You can call us at 477-7807 or visit our website at carsplusguam.com to schedule your test drive today. Jamaican Grill remembers this past year and offers you the Holiday Special. Available March 29th through March 31st at all our jamming locations. It's a two-man pan full of our famous jerk chicken and ribs with plenty of red rice, all for only $19. That's enough Jamaican Grill to feed the whole entire family. The Holiday Special is our way of saying, let's get up and move. We've come a long way and we've got a long way to go, but we got this, Guam. Yaman, yeah, together we can. KUAM News, winner of the 2020 Regional Edward R. Murrow Award for Excellence in Social Media. Welcome back. After a whole school year of the University of Guam campus being closed, faculty and staff are finally preparing to welcome the Tridents back. Tyler Matsnani has the details on what UOG is doing to gear up for the upcoming semesters. The University of Guam had plans to reopen face-to-face -face learning in the fall of 2020, but those plans were put on hold due to a second wave of COVID hitting the island. UOG Chief Marketing and Communications Officer Jonas Makapinlat. We stayed online in the fall of last year, stayed online for the spring of this year, uh, and then uh, now the summer's coming up. We have an opportunity to uh, start having face-to-face -face classes again and gearing up for hopefully more face-to-face -face instruction in, in the fall. The current health and safety guidelines permit a three-feet social distancing measure for grades K through 12. However, UOG will have to restructure classroom settings as the guidelines do not pertain to higher education levels. This would drastically affect the number of people that would be able to be in a classroom. According to Makapinlak, after doing the calculations, the current six-foot social distancing protocol would only allow for just over 30 people in the 200-person capacity lecture hall. That's a huge number of students who wouldn't be able to come in person for a class that's held in the lecture hall. We've got uh, classes that can be held um, both online and in person. We've got some technology that is allowing us to, to hold classes that way in the fall. Um, this is technology that we're setting up now, stuff that's still coming in. Uh, so faculty will be able to, to teach online, but as well uh, 
as well as teach students right in person. Basic sanitation protocols will be followed. Instructors will be given additional time in between classes to disinfect rooms. Plexiglass barriers have also been installed in areas on campus, such as the business and admissions office that deal with customers on a daily basis. However, there are currently no plans for installment in classrooms. The summer will give them time to run through protocols and make adjustments for the fall. And although vaccinations are not mandatory to return to on-campus learning, Macapinlac says it's highly recommended. We feel that that is one way that we're going to um, uh, speed up the recovery process. It just gives us uh, more of a chance at normalcy, I think, uh, if, if we have a majority of people uh, on island that are, that are vaccinated. Summer registration is ongoing for face-to-face, -face, online, and hybrid models of learning. Students can register online at uog.edu. Reporting for Guam's News Network, I'm Tyler Matanani. A bill to establish a certified bona fide farmer registry was discussed at a public hearing today. Department of Agriculture Director Chelsea Munya Brett says there's a need to protect legitimate farmers against unregulated black marketers who undercut prices, against those who illegally lease Chamorro Land Trust farm property, and finally against those who threaten cost consumer safety. I had concerns about produce that is sold um, and identifying who the farmers were that were selling the produce when they were available and questioning what pesticides or fertilizers were used and if they were using it properly. Um, short of having a laboratory locally that can test for pesticide residue on produce, um, this is one small first step that we can do or that we can take to help with this process. But Dr. Bob Barber, a professor of agricultural economics at UOG, says there are bigger hurdles to the success of local farming. Need assessment after need assessment after need assessment over the past 20 years, the number one issue our farmers say is, I don't have any problem growing the product. I don't, you know, my problem is in selling it. The markets don't take. So my, I am constrained by what I can sell, not by what I can produce. And you have any commercial farmer tell you this, many of them could double their production, but it's the markets. Our markets are dominated by imported wholesalers. The bonafide certification would be available to both commercial and subsistence farming. The bill by Senator Clint Rogel is a companion measure to one that just passed, which makes it clear in local law that the theft of farm produce is a criminal offense. The Public Defender Service Corporation is paying close attention to a legislation recently introduced by Senator Amanda Shelton, Bill 100. The measure would allow the Public Defender Service Corporation to receive an existing annual grant of $190,000 to establish an elder law center in order to provide legal services to Guam's Manamku. As stated in the bill's language, the Department of Public Health and Social Services reports that there are over 400 elderly citizens who would benefit from this law as they are currently awaiting legal services. According to Public Defender Stephen Hattori, they have been trying to pursue the center since 2016 and just two weeks ago they set up a pilot project. Many people on the wait list. Right now, the services are going to be limited to power of attorneys, uh, wills, uh, living trusts, and uh, and other types of guard some guardianships as well. Because we're the, the government corporation, it's kind of like the government taking care of our own manoku. Because you know we're able to be more efficient uh, because we're doing it. Uh, we're supposed to be helping it up to forty manoku a month. Oh. And, so we're not billing at, you know, private hourly rates. Attorney Hattori explains how this center is different from services provided by the Judiciary's Office of Public Guardian. The Office of Public Guardian, they serve like an incredible service. And what they do is they uh, uh, get incompetent guardianships for uh, patients who are unable to make decisions for themselves. And so they oftentimes administer, uh, they're also the guardians for some incompetence as well. So it's like, they're, they're really limited to just incompetent guardianships. The pilot project is expected to continue for six months. If this measure becomes law, then it would make the program permanent. The Office of Public Accountability will be releasing their audit findings of the Guam Housing and Urban Renewal Authority. And according to their director, it's looking pretty clean. The this morning on the link, Gura director Ray Tapasya had a chance to share some news his team is pretty proud of as things are looking good for their FY20 audit, which should be released by the Office of Public Accountability in the next few days. 
We're tracking to have the best audit in Gura's 58 year history. Um, last year, uh, we thought it was a significantly improved audit, uh, although we got a lot of criticism and probably because it's an election year. Uh, you know, there were there was talk about uh, receivership and, and all of that stuff. We actually have a better audit this year. We have zero question costs, uh, which I've not known Gura to have zero question costs last year. I think there were $7,000 in question costs, but even at that, when you're operating, a, when you're overseeing as much as $112 million and you have 7,000 in question costs, that's 0.003% of our operations. According to Tapasha, they're on their way to having the housing authority's best audit, but even at that, it's not spotless. And when, like I said, when you handle the amount of money we handle, uh, there's bound to be a different interpretation of our regs, but we've actually got a clean audit on financials, which means all the numbers add up. Right. And then three of the major four programs that we audited, we got clean audits on those. And then the one audit where we had a modified opinion, we're not in full agreement with the, with the auditors on what, the, what their findings were, but we forwarded that to federal authorities for their uh, interpretation. We're not going to get a response in time. So it is what it is. I mean, we disagreed with what they said. Last year, there was a bit of back and forth between the Housing Authority and the Office of Public Accountability with the thought of Gura going into receivership and having a third party custodian. But this time around, Tapasha wants to make one thing clear. Well, it's water under the bridge, but you know, he said we're going into receivership. We haven't gone into receivership, nor will we go into receivership. So I'll leave it at that. For Guam's News Network, I'm Peter Santos. Dave Delgado is on deck next with a look at local sports action. Keep it here. You're watching KUAM. Your community calendar is brought to you by Taco Bell. Whether it's your first meal or your fourth meal, we've got you covered. Taco Bell, live Moss. We don't want to overhype the return of the quesalupa from Taco Bell, so we're skipping all the fanfare. Oh, man. We'll just tell you the quesalupa's cheese stuffed shell is back, and we think you'll like it. The Guam Women's Chamber of Commerce presents Fanatsu Famalawan, Women Rising, on Thursday, April 8th. This virtual conference will reach you wherever you are, featuring international experts and thought leaders sharing their stories. Experience on-demand sessions, master classes, and conversations to inspire and empower. Register today. Fanatsu Famalawan, Inspiring Innovation, April 8th at GuamWomen'sChamber.com. Special thanks to our change agents and our other community partners. We get it. Living to the fullest is tough during COVID-19. You don't need to do it alone, and everyone needs a hand right now. We are here. Feeling overwhelmed? Call 647-8833 and let's talk. Mangaihem is a project of Guam Behavioral